Hare Krishna. So, I'll speak on the topic of how the Bhagavad Gita gives us the real eyes. The Trashtra is the character to whom actually we, the whole Mahabharata war is spoken. And it is spoken to him through Sanjay. Now, Dhritarashtra was born blind. And although he was born blind, that physical blindness deprived him of some things. He could never become the king. And at the start of the Bhagavad Gita, when he speaks, when he asks a question to Sanjay, so the Bhagavad Gita begins with a very striking setting. But there is some person, one person doesn't have even normal vision. And the other person has paranormal vision. So Sanjay can see that which is far away, whereas Dhritarashtra cannot see even that which is close by. And the Bhagavad Gita helps us to understand that actually what is truly worth seeing. So Dhritarashtra begins with the question, Dharma Kshetre, Kuru Kshetre, Samaveta Yutsavaha, Mamakaha Pandava Shaiva, Kimakurvata Sanjaya. So he asked, what happened to Sanjay on the battlefield of Kurukshetra when everyone had assembled? So Dhritarashtra is a, he had, if you look at his life, he was born blind. And he had one time when he could see. Another time, when he got the opportunity to see, but he declined that opportunity. When was the one time when he got to see? That was in the, when Krishna displayed the Vishwarupa. So by this time, Dhritarashtra had become quite, he, his son, Duryodhana had already got married and Duryodhana also had children. So by that time, Dhritarashtra was quite old and yet he was blind. And at that time, we can say that there is, he had more or less given up the hope that he could be the king. Although he had become the king unofficial, circumstantially, because Pandu had retired and there was no one else who could be the king. But he had recognized that he would never have the power fully as a king. So, at that time, when he asked, uh, when Krishna came as Shanti Dut, and Krishna displayed the Vishwarupa. So, when Krishna displayed the Vishwarupa, at that time, though, those who had eyes could no longer see. Because this Vishwarupa was so dazzling. It was so majestic that fire and sparks and smoke seemed to be emanating from it. All the great devatas manifested through him. And in this way, actually, everybody who had eyes were blinded. And Sanjay, actually, if you see in this assembly, there's only Krishna and along with Satyaki, who was a person who had come with Krishna. All the others were Kauravas, and they from the Kaurava side. And they all were blinded. So, on one side, when Krishna had been speaking uh, first to Dhritarashtra, then to Duryodhana, and then again to Dhritarashtra, to persuade him to accept the peace proposal, then finally, Duryodhana felt that Krishna was having too much, was influencing everyone too much, to his detriment. And he charged. He uh, gave the order to charge to his soldiers. They came charging in, and sometimes, say, if we are driving a vehicle, at night, and suddenly the opposite uh, driver shows a glare, then we can't see. At that time, we will stop. Here, the glare was so great that nobody could see. And because nobody could see, not only was the glare so great, but along with that, there was a fearsome sound and noise, and everything suddenly became very fearful. So they had ex everybody had expected opposition when Krishna would be, they would try to arrest Krishna. Here, Krishna is alone. Now, how much can you oppose? But this universal form was so overwhelming, they fell back. And hearing this chaos, hearing the, the soldiers falling back in fear, 
calling out in horror and running away. Mitrashtra asks, what is happening? What is happening? And just as Kimakuruvata, what he asks over here, he asks over there also. What happened, Sanjay? And Sanjay says, Krishna is showing the universal form. Now Krishna, when he showed this, when this, there is there are different kinds of blindness. One kind of blindness is where we can't see anything. Hmm? Other kind of blindness, says, where we can see, but we can't make out what we are seeing. It's like when there is a mist. When there is a mist, it's not that we are literally blind. We can see the whiteness all around us, but because of that whiteness, we can't see what is ahead. So, if somebody asks at that time, okay, what's happening? I can't see anything, there is a mist around. Now, if you literally couldn't see anything, then how could we even know there is a mist around? We can see something, but we are not able to see much because there is a mist over there. And then, beyond that, when, uh, so he, although when nobody could see, what it meant was, they understood that Krishna has shown something very fearsome, something which just cannot be fathomed, something which can definitely not be controlled or arrested. But the specific details, they were not able to discern. But they understood Krishna is showing the universal form. So Sanjay told, Krishna is showing the universal form. And then at that time, Dhritarashtra expresses an extraordinary desire. He recognizes that his son, he knows that his son has just tried to arrest Krishna. And he says, oh Krishna, I have never seen anything in my life. Please, let me see this one side of yours. Let me see your new universal form. Krishna had no reason to oblige Dhritarashtra, we consider. Dhritarashtra had remained passive. He had given his, at least his silent consent, if not his active consent. Two, uh, Duryodhana, uh, Duryodhana had done all kinds of atrocities against the Pandavas. And yet, at this point, Krishna would give Dhritarashtra the vision. So, now why did Krishna give such a vision? Actually, when Krishna went as the peace messenger, his purpose was to try for peace to the best of his capacity. Now, so, Krishna actually offered everything on the most accommodating terms. He had said, just give five villages to the Pandavas. So, his mood in the whole Shantidut pastime, when he's gone as the peace messenger, is actually very accommodating. He goes out of his way to somehow accommodate. So here, at one level, the purpose of showing the Vishwarupa is to thwart Duryodhana's wicked plan to try to arrest Krishna. At another level, Krishna could have thwarted that in any way. We see that. And other occasions, Krishna displays the universal form there are different circumstances. At the, the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna will request Krishna, please show me the universe. And when Mother Ishida asks him to open his mouth, that time also she shows one kind of universal form, all the whole universe in his mouth. So Krishna has shown the universal form at different times. And each time there is a different purpose and he shows the universal form. Now here, what were his purposes? It is one purpose of course to foil Durudhana's plan. Now, that was not the only purpose. Krishna could have foiled it any other way. By showing the Vishwarupa, Krishna wanted to demonstrate to Duryodhana and to everyone over there that his power cannot be counted. That whoever tries to go against that power, that person is actually going against the one who is the source of the universe. Atha Vishvesha Vishwatman Vishwamurte Swakeshume Kunti Maharani na prayer says, you are Vishwesha, you are the lord of the universe. Vishwatman, you are the soul of the universe. Atha Vishwesha Vishwatman, Vishwamurte, and you are the form of the universe. So, it's interesting, the relationship you're describing here is, you are the soul of the universe, that means that you are present within the universe. You are the controller of the universe. That means you are without and you are controlling it. You are inside it, you are outside it controlling it, and, and you are the universe. 
you are inside the universe you are outside the universe and you are the universe that is vishvesha vishvatan vishvamurti so she is telling this and krishna has demonstrated the vishvarupa to again pursue his peace proposal it's interesting this vishvarupa does not cause any casualties although there is so much power that is demonstrated krishna has gone as a peace messenger and he stays faithful to his purpose of being a peace messenger he does not cause there is fear and everybody falls back in terror but he does not cause any harm to anyone so in warfare or in negotiation there is a or in confrontation you could say when two people are confronting each other and then they are also negotiating there is a vital role that is played by deterrence deterrence means that if the other person knows you have great power then that will deter and stop the other person from doing something foolish so it's like if you look at the 1970s there were um, many 1960 1970s many wars happened between india pakistan india china but in the 1980s 1990s as nuclear weapons started getting developed now although there is always infiltration militancy but all out war is not there because each party knows if we if do something extra the other party can just throw nuclear war on us so now this is not to support nuclear weapons this is simply to illustrate the point of deterrence so krishna demonstrated the whole vishwarupa to show the kauravas his prowess and that could serve as a deterrent deterrent means that oh, don't fight how can you fight against such power and after that as the whole army which the large part of the army which durudana had got to arrest krishna that was, was fell back and now krishna had already demonstrated his power to everyone over there including durudana at right now when the dush mitrashtra asked please give me eyes krishna decided let me do this also so maybe the king will realize the futility of going against him of pandering to his sons desires and going against him continuing to go against him so krishna showed him the vishwaru prabhupada in 11th chapter of the bhagavad gita his commentary lights right that when arjuna when krishna sees the universal krishna shows the universal form arjuna after sometimes says you know this is wonderful but i don't want to see this please show me your saumya roopa please show me your sweet beautiful form the point there is that krishna is that prabhupada writes that a devotee is not interested in a godless display of opulence now this is a very strong phrase to use it is god who is displaying his opulence in fact the 10th chapter is known as the opulence of the absolute and what is described in the 10th chapter is depicted in the 11th chapter the 10th chapter of the bhagavad gita is vibhuti yoga and the opulence of the absolute and that same opulence of how the lord pervades the universe uh, that what is displayed is depicted depicted means it is shown visually what is verbally described uh, uh, then it is visually dis- visually depicted so it is krishna who is doing this it is god who is displaying his opulence and the pan- uh, and prabhupada is saying it's not interested in a devotee is not interested in a godless display of opulence what does it mean a devotee is interested in loving krishna and whatever will help in loving krishna a devotee is interested in that but apart from that a devotee has no interest in just seeing something which is just awesome a devotee may appreciate that and prabhupada writes that arjuna asked that this be shown so that the world would know krishna's glory manne se rita chakya maya drishtum ite prabhu yogeshwar uttam eta darshayatman mauvena if it is possible o lord for me to see the form please reveal it to me so he's taking a humble position asking for the revelation but his purpose is to actually help uh to help people to gain conviction in what krishna has said 
in the Kaurava assembly over there, the prominent decision makers was Parishan Mekha Duryodhan. As Bhishma was there, Vidura was there, Drona was there. But none of them were actually people who had the power to take a decision. The Dhritarashtra who had the power. And Dhritarashtra was always carried away by Duryodhana's feelings, Duryodhana's desires, Duryodhana's pressures. So, when we become attached to someone, then our attachment gives that person control over us. So, it's like uh, if somebody has a, has a machine, you press one button and then say if you have a heater or a cooler, you press one button, start heating up. Press another button, start cooling down. So, actually when we become attached to someone, we give them control of the buttons. They press the button and we just function accordingly. So now, when Krishna displayed the Vishwarupa to the Trashtra, what is his purpose? That Durudhana is not going to, Durudhana is not going to listen. At least let Dhritarashtra listen. Let Dhritarashtra see. And Dhritarashtra beholds the form and Krishna's power is such that the same form which is dazzling to everyone else, Dhritarashtra could see. He was also, he could see the effulgence, but he was not blinded by the dazzle. Sometimes the sun is bright, but the sun is not blinding. Sometimes the sun can become so bright that you can't even look at it. For example, when the sun is rising, at that time you can look at the sun. But when it is at noon, uh, the sun is blazing, we, can't, we know the sun is there, but you can't look at it. So, Krishna arranged so that Dhritarashtra could see the form. And after seeing this form, when the Kauravas had withdrawn, they just fled from the assembly, Krishna laughed. Vishwarupa laughed and then Vishwarupa withdrew in his form. While Krishna was been displaying the Vishwarupa, at that time there had been inauspiciousness all around. There had been fearsome symptoms. Now we must say that if what are the fearsome symptoms? It appeared as a then the, the, there were inauspicious animals, jackals were howling, it, uh, there were storms which seemed to be there in the outside atmosphere. Unseasonal rains were coming. The sun had become dimmed. Hmm. Huge waves suddenly rose in the oceans. And Krishna is displaying something miraculous. When, why, if Krishna is doing something extraordinary, that's auspicious. So why would that lead to some inauspicious symptoms? Actually, it is inauspicious for those who are against Krishna. Every manifestation of Krishna has a particular purpose. So, Krishna, uh, when he hugs Mother Yashoda, at that time Mother Yashoda feels so much joy. She hugs Mother Yashoda and she hugs Krishna and Krishna hugs her. Those gentle arms and she feels it around her neck. She's filled with so much love and joy. But when Krishna put those same arms around Trunavarta, Trunavarta had taken Krishna high up into the sky and Krishna put those arms around her. When you put those arms around him, at that time, <laughs> Krishna actually, what he did, when first the first demon who came to attack Krishna was Putana. And when Krishna caught Putana and sucked out her life with her milk, at that time Putana screamed loudly. And that scream alarmed the Vrajivasis. Now in this case, Drunavas had already taken Krishna high up into the sky. And Krishna did not want Vajvasis to get too alarmed. They were already sufficiently alarmed seeing Krishna high up in the sky with this demon. But then Krishna, he, when he hugged Trunavarta, Trunavarta thought, oh, this child is getting scared, that's why he's hugging me. But Krishna was not scared. Krishna hugged him so tightly that when Trunavarta started feeling choked, Krishna's hug with his small arms was so tight that Trunavarta couldn't even scream. Like, ah, I started bulging, his air couldn't come out and Krishna was just tightly holding him and Krishna tightly held him while increasing his weight. So the point is, Krishna's arms are very loving for Mother Yashoda because she approaches him with love. But Krishna's arms are very, very painfully strong and hard for Trunavarta because he's approaching Krishna with animosity, with hatred, with a desire to kill. So, 
here the demonstration of the Vishwarupa by Dhritarashtra was for one purpose alone. That purpose was to actually create fear. Now where logic doesn't work, Krishna had used logic in the the whole peace negotiations. <laughs> so here he wanted to demonstrate his power. And that's why when the, when Krishna has a particular intent, nature also cooperates with him. So the inauspiciousness apparently that was there, it is not inauspicious because whatever Krishna does is ultimately auspicious. But if somebody is on the wrong course and to stop them, if something is demonstrated. The purpose of that is actually to get that person in the right. So everything Krishna did just so that he could make his peace, peace, peace proposal successful. And then Dhritarashtra, uh, he, as Krishna walked out of the assembly, Dhritarashtra's eyes went blind once again. He saw Krishna displaying the Vishwarupa. He saw Krishna uh, re-manifesting his normal form. And everybody had just fled from there more or less. Those who were not, not fled, they had been paralyzed. Just couldn't do anything. Krishna just nonchalantly walked away Satyaki, joking with him as if nothing has happened. He had given this spectacular display. And then, the next morning, Krishna, he still, when Krishna followed, followed the etiquette, so he came to meet the Dhritarashtra and the Kuru elders. He said, uh, I am taking your leave now. Mm. So, the Dhritarashtra came forward. No, Krishna, Please know that I have no desire for this world. But I am unable to control my son. I have nothing against you. I strongly wish that the peace be there. But I can't control my son. So Krishna looked at the other Puru elders and he said, Elders, all of you have heard now the ruler of the earth admitting his powerlessness in the face of his son and therefore war now is inevitable. So the question comes over here, right? why did Dhritarashtra, when Dhritarashtra asks Krishna, please give me eyes to see, to see his universal form. That means he does have some understanding of Krishna's power. Otherwise, why would he ask for such a benediction? So, this was even before he had seen any power. He had heard, of course, from the sages that Krishna is Vishnu descended to this world. That's how the Mahabharata depicts it. So, he had known about it, but still, he had not really accepted it. Here, when Krishna started showing the universal form, he saw. First, he requested. So, that blindness which had troubled him throughout his life, Krishna removed that blindness in one moment. So he had little, some little faith by which he asked for that request. He made that request. And then Krishna fulfilled that request. That itself is extraordinary. For someone to be able to free him from his blindness is extraordinary. And then beyond that, not, it's one thing to, to not have eyes and then to have eyes and to see something ordinary. But it's quite another to get eyes and to see something most extraordinary. So actually... He got an experience of Krishna's power through a double demonstration. The first demonstration was that the blind was able to see. So, for somebody blind to be able to see, it's a momentous event. And there are times in history when some sages are able to, some saints, some sages, they do some miracles and they make some blind person able to see. Everybody says you are such a great saint. In the Bible, Jesus does some miracles. One of them is that he makes a blind person able to see. And that often Christians doubt that this is the proof <coughs> of Jesus' greatness. <coughs> so what is the proof of... So the Thrasher got the first proof that he was there. though blind he was able to see. The second proof was he got to see the Vishwarupa also. And yet after this, he did not change his disposition. He said, I am powerless. 
So how does attachment actually work? What does it take for someone to give up attachment? God himself comes, God first requests and God demonstrates both he has done. So why does someone not give up the attachment? That is the power of the free will. Every soul has been given free will by God. And Krishna never takes the free will away from anyone. That free will means that we can choose what we want. And Krishna may prompt us to make a particular choice, but Krishna doesn't force us. I'll come back to this point again towards the end. But if we consider later, just before the Kurukshetra war, Vyasadev comes to him. And Vyasadev tells him that I can give you a benediction. That I can give you eyes so that you can see this Kurukshetra war. Now, the Trashtra is caught between, we could say, desiring the impossible and dreading the inevitable. Desiring the impossible means he is somehow desiring that my son should win. <laughs> that is, it is impossible. And dreading the inevitable. The inevitable means he knows that his son is going to die. And he's caught in this, he somehow wants his sons to win. He knows the battle. My sons have acted grievously wrong. My sons are going to be destroyed. And thus, he tells Mithrash, he tells Vyasadev that I live for my sons. I could not see my sons when they were living. How will I be able to tolerate them dying now? Therefore, I don't want this vision. But now, it's a, even at this point, if he had put his foot strongly down, he could have stopped the war. He acknowledges that oh, my sons are going to die. But then he says, give this benediction to Nitharashtra. Sorry, to Sanjay. Why Sanjay? Because he wants to know what is happening. What is going to happen. So Sanjay gets the switch. So, if we consider over here, what was exactly his, his, pro, his, his, his problem? Was it his blindness? Krishna had removed his blindness, Vyasadeva had been ready to remove his blindness. Now, if the same Krishna who had given him the eyes to see the Vishwarupa, if he had asked, Krishna could have given him the eyes back also. But, in both these cases, they offered him vision back for a finite time duration. He could see the universal form and he could see the war. So, <clears throat> his problem was not that he was blind physically, it was rather he was so attached that that attachment blinded him to reality. And because of that, no matter what was done, he just couldn't change. He just couldn't change his disposition. He just continued doing what he was doing. And that was staying passive. He stayed passive while his son was obstinate. So for all of us, when we go through life, we all face our daily challenges, small challenges, big challenges. And we all want that when we are trying to practice bhakti, when we are trying to do something spiritual, we may desire that something extraordinary happen. And by that extraordinary happening, my faith will increase. If some miracle happens in my life, this problem goes away, then by that, my faith will increase. If, if I want this and if this works out, my faith will increase. Now, we often wait for something special to happen by which either our problems will disappear, our desires will be fulfilled, or thereby we will be able to get, uh, we will be able to both improve our material life and then we think, if my material life improves, <laughs> this problem goes away, this desire gets fulfilled, and that will increase my faith. And once my faith is increased, then I will practice spiritual life more seriously. So that is the idea that more, many people have. Uh, more, we may also have that. 
if only this problem would go away, things would be so nice. And if Krishna removes this problem, then I will. I will have faith in Krishna. My faith in Krishna will become so much stronger. So he, here, there's, there is the material life in which each one of us, we have our body, we have our family, we have our jobs. And in all of these, we are acting. And naturally, our consciousness is, uh, is, focused, is primarily consumed at the material level. Because these things, they take so much of our time, energy, they need. It's needed over there. But along with that, there's a spiritual life where we develop our relationship with Krishna. And often we feel that if things work out at the material level, <coughs> that will increase our faith. And then I'll practice bhakti more seriously at the spiritual level. Now for Dhritarashtra, he was so attached that even when Krishna demonstrated his prowess, twice, by giving him vision and by giving him the vision to see the universal form, still he didn't change. So that means that the change in our material situation is no guarantor of the change in our spiritual disposition. That for all of us, to become more serious in spiritual life, we need to change our spiritual disposition. But the change in the material situation, if this problem goes away, then I'll practice Bhakti more seriously. I'll faith in Krishna will increase. The change in the material situation is no guarantor of the change in the spiritual disposition that we will move towards Krishna. Now, when Krishna speaks the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, Arjuna is also similarly blinded. Arjuna also, at one level, has similar conceptions. Oh, these are all my family members. These are all my dynasty members. How can I fight against them? How can I fight against them? I can't. And therefore, he says, I will not fight. So at one level, Arjuna also gets somewhat attached. And then, Krishna shows the universal form. But even before Krishna shows the universal form, Arjuna has already accepted. After the Jatushro Ki Bhagavad chapter, is Param Brahma Param Dhamma Pavitram Paramam Bhavan Purusham Shashvatam Divyam Adi Deva Majam Vidhom. That you are the Supreme Lord. I accept you, I have no doubt about it. So, what happens is that Krishna, by the message of the Gita, helps Arjuna to understand how Krishna himself is all at all. And because Arjuna has the devotional heart, he connects with. And by that connection with him, by the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjun is illumined. Arjun's heart is transformed. So Dhritarashtra, even after hearing the Bhagavad Gita and hearing about the universal form being displayed over there, still his heart is again going to get transformed. So this, that means what there is in our life, there is something which we do, which is in our control, and something which is not in our control, which we hope works out right, which, that means that Krishna will make it right. But the point is that we need to, each one of us, recognize that waiting for Krishna to do something special, that is something which is no guarantor that it will change from us. If we decide to make the change, if you now Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna heard the Bhagavad Gita, just by the hearing he was transformed. So for all of us, there are certain, in our life, certain things are in our control, certain things are not in our control. Whether it is in our family life, in our, in our social life, in our professional life, in our spiritual life. And often, we think that if that thing works out, then my life will be, will be my life will move so smoothly. It may, it may not. Because the nature of the mind is, if the mind develops a habit of blaming, you know, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. So then that same mind, what it will do is, even if one big problem is for, solved, is removed, the mind will find some other problem to blame. And in that way, as long as we don't take the responsibility to do our part, we will always find something out there as a, as a reason to blame for our situation. So it is called scapegoating, finding a scapegoat. So if as long as we keep finding scapegoats, we can't grow in any way in our life. So 
to the throne of the bhagavad gita tells us it reveals krishna's glory it reveals krishna's greatness it reveals krishna's sweetness and by that it in it inspires a transformation in arjun it is arjun who chooses to be transformed and when arjun chooses to be transformed that demonstrates to all of us that we also need to take do our part so rather than waiting for krishna to do something special something miraculous we focus on doing our part and that for doing that if we just connect ourselves with the gita if we study the gita if we practice bhakti according to whatever little bhakti we have according to whatever little potency we have if we practice it then by that slowly we'll start seeing that our own heart will be it will transform we will become more connected with krishna even the situation outside is troublesome the for us inside there will be greater strength the greater strength we we'll find that we will be able to face that situation the world can hurt us in many ways and you can keep blaming you know the world hurt me this way the world hurt me this way the world hurt me that way but greater than the world's power to hurt is krishna's power to heal greater than the world's power to hurt is krishna's power to heal and arjun shifts his vision by the here in the bhagavad gita from the world's power to hurt oh so many things are so many people are going to die so much catastrophe will happen his vision shifts to krishna's power to heal krishna is with me and krishna is with everyone over here even if every one of them dies that's not the end of their journey krishna is with them and krishna will guide them onwards and when this shift happens that okay there are many big problems in my life but krishna has the power to heal me krishna has the power to strengthen me when we shift the vision to krishna he will guide us and dhritarashtra unfortunately never accepted the guidance that he, and he just kept blaming no oh, he first said why was i blind then why can't my son become the king oh why is my son not listening to me he kept uh, uh he kept uh, pushing off responsibility for his situation and actions to things beyond his control and thus eventually everything went out of his control all his sons were killed and he was left alone he was left helpless he feared displeasing his sons but then he ended up destroying his sons <laughs> so that he could have avoided if he had stopped his sons or he had stopped himself from indulging his sons and the bhagavad gita gives us the eyes that for we may not be in a situation like dhritarashtra where we are attached to someone and someone is manipulating us but the point is for in every one of our lives there are things which have gone wrong and those things have hurt us those things may be hurting us also right but we keep blaming those things and we don't do our part to rectify and what is our part to rectify the first is that we take shelter of krishna we practice bhakti diligently we understand the wisdom of the bhagavad gita absorb our sense of remembrance of krishna and you'll find that by his grace we'll be able to gain the inner strength by which we can either tolerate the outer problem it is if it is there and it can't be removed or we can overcome that outer problem and move on in our life so that is what the bhagavad gita assures us machittah sarva durgaani mat prasada karishasi if you become conscious of me you will pass over all obstacles by my grace so i'll summarize i spoke today on how uh, the how the gita gives us eyes to see but the trasha never got the eyes to see krishna gave the trasha the eyes uh, when he went as a shanti doot when durudhana tried to arrest krishna he displayed the vishwarup everybody got blinded krishna gave him the eyes to see why did krishna give the eyes because krishna was doing everything possible to avoid the war so he demonstrated power to the kauravas to durudhana and his associates to get them to to deter them from the war when logic doesn't work a demonstration of power may work and when dhritarashtra because he was so weak minded then he demonstrated his power in two ways first he gave him the eyes to see and then he gave him the eyes to see the universal form which is blinding to everyone but which dazzled him but didn't blind him. 
and yet the Dhritarashtra did not change. Now, did he not know that Krishna is God? Did he not accept that Krishna is God? He knew it. To some extent, he accepted also. But it never. In, his heart was filled so with so much attachment that what was in his head never entered into his heart. And thus, when the war came up, he was desiring the impossible and dreading the inevitable. And he asked Sanjay to get the eyes rather than himself because he knew his sons were going to die. So uh, there is a he Vitrashtra eventually lost everything because of his attachments. And Arjun was also similarly overcome by attachment to his relatives. But when Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, Arjun shifted his vision from the situation to the Lord. From the world's power to hurt to Krishna's power to heal. So we often wait for some change in our external situation and we think that that, that change in our material situation will help us to change our spiritual disposition. Only if this problem goes away, only if this desire is fulfilled, only if this person stops being like this, then I can move forward in my life. That may or may not happen. With Dhritarashtra, it never happened, and with us also, it may not happen. So rather than waiting for the world, to stop hurting us, we can start turning towards Krishna right now. And the more we absorb ourselves in Krishna, the more we'll experience His healing potency in our life. And thus, we will to move forwards. Krishna assures us that He will help us overcome all obstacles if we just become conscious of it. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, any questions or comments? So about talking about the attachment, right? So there are many anathas like that. So sometimes when we think about the, when we face those anathas, we feel disheartened that you know, like even though doing bhakti or seva, whatever capacity we have, but still those anathas are haunting us and mm. you know, disheartened us. Mm. So how how to do this? Yeah. So if you feel like disheartened by Anartha, then what should we do? <laughs> yeah, sometimes we can't succeed in Krishna consciousness. But even if we can't succeed in Krishna consciousness, we can fail in Krishna consciousness, not fail out of Krishna consciousness. What that means is Krishna consciousness is not just about adhering to certain standards. It is not just about resisting some temptations. It is about focusing on Krishna. So sometimes some anartha, some conditioning weakens us, overpowers us. And that makes us feel more the need for Krishna in our lives. And that makes us call out to Krishna more. Then we are actually becoming more conscious of Krishna. And as we keep doing that, in over a period of time, the anartha will come, it will stay for some time, it will go away, it will come back again. But in between, we are intensifying our devotion, we are strengthening ourselves. And that strengthening of ourselves will help us overcome that anatha later, whenever it comes back. But if we fail out of Krishna consciousness means we just become so disheartened and we just give up practicing. I mean, what is the use of this? I can never do this, I can do that. And what are we focusing? We are focusing on our weakness rather than God's greatness. Krishna is so weak, I can't do it. But still, you have the power. You can and purify me, so I teach you to. So rather than fighting against the weakness, we fight to connect ourselves with Krishna. Our endeavor should not be just to do that. Our endeavor is to connect ourselves with Krishna. When we do that, we will be able to overcome that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so how does Vidura's Vidura's good question? How does Vidura's word Vidura's word is cause the trash to change? Yeah. So there are mm, we all experience frustration in life. Mm. But the nature of illusion is that nature of Maya is such that Maya doesn't allow us to become hopelessly frustrated. We are frustrated but hopefully frustrated. Okay, this didn't work out, it's terrible, but maybe this will work out. This will work out. 
this will work. Now we do want things to work out in our life, but more important than thinking things working out is that we work out our way towards Krishna. We need to move towards Krishna. If we keep deferring that, postponing that, then it's a problem. Uh, then, uh, in the case of Dhritaraj, in the case when his sons had finally been killed, the hope that he, through his sons he would become the king that was lost forever. And then, because he had been so attached, he did not realize the predicament he was in, the situation that he was in. Not only had his sons been killed, but the people whom he had killed, he was living at their expense. So when Vidura came and spoke to him that Bhima Apavirjita Pindam that it like a person may feed one's remnants to a dog like that you are eating what Bhima has thrown away. No, it's not like that. Yudhishthir actually gave him very uh, treated it very respectfully. But so this is your reality. It's the Pandavas that earned the kingdom and you are living on them. So that jolted him out. That means at one level his attachment, there is no chance of getting fulfilled. But after that, still there was an illusion. Okay, that I am living comfortably. I can continue living. But then when the reality of the situation was brought in front of him, forcefully, and along with that, there was no hope really for him to improve his, to fulfill his material needs. And that's when. So just the frustration of our life may not, uh, may not take us towards spirituality. Nor is the instruction from someone alone take us towards spirituality. But the frustration and the instruction come together. And we see no way out of the frustration. And then the instruction helps us to see the frustration in a more spiritually uh, spiritually prompting light. Then we can move towards Krishna. Okay. We can at least grow spiritually. Okay. So it said that Dhritarashtra, the way I put it is that Dhritarashtra had to lose everything before he lost his blindness. Before he lost, lost his blindness. blindness yeah. His blindness of attachment, his blindness of illusion, he had to lose everything before he lost his blindness. <laughs> now Krishna can help us if we take to, sorry, to him. We all also lose everything. But we can gain Krishna before we lose everything. If we take to practice of Bhakti. Maybe when Dhritarashtra got the eyes, then Krishna with mercy let him face it and see what I am. Does Krishna try to show him his power that I am so strong? Try to make him feel? Hmm. That's the one. Second, why Krishna has this try to show him with the fear thing? Because he was still thinking that I can, I have hundred sons or I can do, I have the power or I am desired to be a king. But still he know that he is powerful and he, that's why he is requesting, I want to see. Hmm. That's what he showed. He is aware of that, that I want to see what Krishna has, mm. what he can show else, or say, I guess. But still he is, why he is not requesting at that time that give me those eyes with whom I can leave this, where I am being attached, material things, or with my sons, or all the Maya thing. Why can't I move to the other thing? If we have that type of thinking, mm. why he is just thinking that, okay, show me your power, I can, I want to see that. Or, I don't know, sometimes it's confusing to me. Yeah, so why did Dhritarashtra uh, ask to see Vish Krishna Vishwarupa and why did Krishna just show him his powerful form? Why did he not ask for the eyes to give up his, by which he could give up his attachments? You see, that is something which is up to the soul. Krishna cannot take away our free will. Krishna, he has made us in such a way that he gives each one of us free will. And with that free will, we can pray to Krishna, please free me of my attachment. Because it is we who have to free ourselves. It is, it is not that the attachments are holding on to us. It is we who are holding on to attachments. There's a famous story of Ashtavakramuni that he had come to Maharaj Janak's court and at that time uh, some sages asked him, some people asked him, how can you give up attachments? And just, as soon as he heard this question, he just ran out of Dasani. And people were like, what happened? Did you offend him in some way? Why is he running? They all started running after him. And he ran into the palace gardens and he ran, and he held, clutched the tree, you know, hugged the tree you know, tightly. And he says, oh tree, let go of me, let go of me, let go of me. So what? The people were thinking, has the sage gone mad? First one, he suddenly ran away like that. And now he is, he says, then finally, you know, they approach him, he says, let go of the tree, let go of the tree. 
Then he said, please, what are you doing? He said, no, this tree is holding on to me. Said, no, the tree is not holding on to you. You are holding on to it. He said, exactly. Because your attachments are not holding on to you. You are holding on to your attachments. So that means, not that the attachments are not there. They are there. But actually, it is for us to free ourselves. When we start taking the steps to free ourselves, then Krishna can help us. This is when God can't help those who don't want to be helped. So, Trashtra, he wanted to see Krishna's power, but he really had no desire also to give up the attachment to his son. That desire also was not there with him. He was attached to his sons and he never saw that attachment as a problem. It's only when we identify something as a problem then we can rectify it. But he never identified his attachment to his son as a problem. He said, I'm just doing what a father should be doing for his son. That way, right in his, when Vidura was born itself, at that time Vidura had told him there are inauspicious signs seen when he's born. He said, you'll have 99 other sons. Just let this son go. He said, this son will cause the destruction of your dynasty. But he did not do that. So he never identified his attachment as a problem. That's why he did not ask me anything else. Or is it already being uh, the desire of Krishna to do this? If we say like this. Yeah, is it the desire? saying it's all what Krishna is looking to see. Have. Is it the desire of Krishna that all this happened? See, there are multiple levels of understanding this. Krishna is the well wisher of everyone. It is not that Krishna wants bad things to happen in the world. It is not Krishna who wants people to do bad things. So, Krishna, nothing happens without Krishna's sanction. There is a different Krishna's sanction and Krishna's intention. Krishna's sanction means you want it, I allow it. Krishna's intention means this is what I want. So, Krishna doesn't intend that anyone do bad things. Krishna doesn't intend that bad things happen to people in any way, that people become victimized by other people. But Krishna has given everyone freedom. So to say that uh, say that everything was Krishna's will is actually philosophically not correct because everybody has freedom. So based on how we use our free will, if somebody uses the free will again and again and again in the wrong way then that, that free will itself becomes habituated to acting in a wrong way. Mm-hmm. That means what happens in this world, there are three broad factors which call it. There is God's will, there is free will, and there is evil. Mm-hmm. Evil is the anartha, the conditioning. So, after doing something again and again and again, one stops feeling that it is wrong. You start habitually doing it. So, such people become hard and criminal. So free will is there in everyone. Free will can be used right and free will can be used wrongly. But when somebody repeatedly misuses the free will, then their capacity to use the free will becomes lesser and lesser and lesser. The conditioning becomes more and more. And they start becoming habitual wrong ways. So, what happens is that Dhritarashtra, so Dhritarashtra used, refused to use his free will in a responsible way. And Duryodhana was already evil. He had become so envious, so brazen, it was openly acting in evil ways. So what happened was not that, it's not that Krishna's will that this terrible war take place. It was the Dhritarashtra's abuse of free will and it was Duryodhana's evil that caused the war to take place. Yeah. So uh, how do we understand uh, when uh, Krishna perhaps uh, uses his yoga my potency to cover up uh, Somebody's uh, cover up somebody and they may do something which is seemingly antagonistic to Krishna. So, is that seen as Krishna trying to control the free will or. Um, Can you give an example? So, this is not necessarily a Yokuma example, but the example that comes to mind is when Jai Vijay were at the Dwarpals at Vaikunta and the Kumaras came in. So, at one level, you can see that they were just following their duty, but uh, you know, they in a way the stages were insulted. And okay, the question, yeah. So, if somebody is uh, 
by Krishna's arrangement acting against Krishna. Then is it Krishna controlling their free will? Not exactly controlling their free will. It is they are surrendering their free will to Krishna to serve him in whatever way Krishna wants. So sometimes, so, so this is described specific, specifically about Jay and Vijay. This is not described about all the demons. This is not described about Dhritarashtra. This is not described about Duryodhana. And so sometimes, in some cases, Krishna may want his devotees to serve him in a particular way. And for that purpose, he may arrange situations in their life. But they also willing. They are also willing to serve in that. Krishna doesn't take the free will away from anyone. That is, that if we see in the spiritual world also, when Krishna is doing a particular activity, Shudama is trying to tie Krishna. She has a free will. Krishna sometimes runs away. Krishna sometimes catches. So Shudama has a free will, but she is using it for the service of Krishna. That is relatively easy to understand. But there are in the spiritual world. Jatila and Kutila, but they try to create obstacles between Krishna and uh, Radharani. There, how they are doing Krishna's way, that seems to be a little more difficult to understand. Yeah. But the idea is they create excitement. It's opposition that creates some excitement in Krishna's lila. So we could say that Yashodama acts for Krishna's pleasure. Jatila Kutila also act for Krishna's pleasure, but in a uh, indirect way. And then. Similarly, there may be some demons who may act in that way. So now, these are all very exceptional situations. We can't say that these are situations that apply all the time. So sometimes the devotees are given a particular role by Krishna, and then they take up that role. But it is uh, they take up that role to please Krishna in that particular service. But it's not that everyone who's acting demoniac is acting in that way. And we can also see what is our purpose in studying scriptures so we can look at a transcendental level and say that everyone is orchestrated by krishna mm-hmm. but then if you look only at the transcendental level then there is nothing ethical or practical to learn from it it's all krishna so then that is one way to approach it and we just relish the past but if you want to learn some life lessons then you have to look not at the transcendental level but at the practical level Yes, I didn't really understand you, Radha. <clears throat> so how we can keep ourselves focused all the time in Krishna and even keep Krishna in each and every situation? Because we have a lot of temptations around us, mm-hmm. lot of even duties to do. Sometimes we forget to do the... Yeah. So how do we keep Krishna in the center in our household life, family life? It's a matter of Firstly, of intention. That means that Ishana Chakravarti used the example that if somebody is uh, as a family, but their their job takes them away from the family, they are staying far away, and they are doing externally many things. They are negotiating with their uh, customers, clients, doing this, doing that. But in their heart, they know that I am doing all this for my family. So. Then the action, practical aid may not be that the family is the forefront of their consciousness. Practically, I have to deal with this person, I have to deal with this person. But in intention, it is all for the, for the family. This is similarly, the devotee's intention is always to serve Krishna. They have to engage in various activities. But the purpose is Krishna. However, to have this intention, we need some strong affection for Krishna. Like a person who goes away from the family, if they have no attachment, they have no affection for the family, then they will not even think about the family. They will think about elsewhere. So there has to be affection. And that affection, for similarly we have to have for Krishna. Otherwise, while doing our worldly activities, we we'll just get consumed by it. And for developing that affection, we need some steady or practice of direct devotion. Direct devotion means some amount of satsang, some puja, some sadhana, some japa, some swadhyaya. When we do these studying scriptures, associating with devotees, worshipping with Krishna, then that creates that bond of affection with us, within us, that bhakti within us. And when that bhakti is there, then whatever we do, it will be done for Krishna. <coughs> 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 
Thank you very much. La Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Binda ki, Tai Gaur Prima Nandi. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.